from the failure of UK efforts to reduce health inequalities. I guess it, it seems um, slightly bleak in some ways because there have been long-term efforts to reduce health inequalities in the UK and, and we don't have much evidence of success. But I think it's important to remember that we can often learn as much, maybe more, from failed efforts as from successes. So hopefully there are some useful lessons in there. And there are definitely some parallels um, with what's going on in Canada. Um, uh, that it, so this follows on very nicely with Kate's presentation. So we'll see that in a minute. So just to give an outline of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about um, a tobacco control policy efforts, policy efforts to reduce health inequalities, and policy commitments to the idea of evidence-based policy, all of which were really strong in the UK in this period, 1997 to 2010, so this 13-year period. Since that time, the picture has uh, changed a little bit. So in Scotland, uh, the efforts in these three areas has remained pretty strong. But I in England, uh, it's more variable. Le less interest in health inequalities, shall we say. I'm, f I'm first going to mention um, the two very different perspectives that we have within the public health communities. And by that, I mean researchers, advocates, and policymakers. Um, so people who look at this relationship, health inequalities and tobacco control, from the perspective of tobacco and smoking as being their starting point. And then people who look at it from the perspective of health inequalities and the social determinants of health as their starting point. So I'm just going to use a couple of slides just to outline how different those perspectives are. And I'll, I'll come back to that later. Then I'm going to tell two different stories. So the first is Scottish and UK efforts to reduce smoking and smoking-related inequalities in the UK. Um, and the second is the specific efforts to reduce health inequalities. And that was very broadly conceived, but I mean was mainly measured by uh, indicators around life expectancy overall. Um, my basic argument is that the UK has achieved reductions in tobacco use and improvements in population health averages, but has not achieved reductions in health inequalities or smoking-related inequalities. Um, and population level improvements are increasingly threatened by this. So I think there is a need for a change and there is a need for these two different parts of the public health community to start get, getting better at working together. Um, and so then looking to the future, I'm going to talk a bit about how to bring these two agendas together. So um, the contrasting um, approaches, and th thinking about this, I think is summed up really nicely by this article that was published by Lawrence Gura and colleagues um, uh, a few years ago in 2009. So they produced these graphs, and so they're survival curves, um, and, they're, and they're separating people by um, sex, so they've got women and men, by social class, so we've got the top social classes compared to the bottom social classes, and by current smokers and never smokers. So they produced this from a 28-year cohort study in the west of Scotland, and then they concluded this message. So it was, it, Lawrence Grower works at um, an institute that's very much situated between research and policy. So he was making, they were making specific recommendations to policymakers. So what they said was smoking itself was a greater source of health inequality than social position and nullified women's survival advantage over men. This suggests the scope for reducing health inequalities is limited unless many smokers in lower social positions stop smoking. So the interpretation of this message from a policy perspective, I think, would very much be if you want to reduce health inequalities, then you need to focus your efforts on tobacco control. Alex Scott Samuel, who's a long-term researcher in the health inequalities field, took the same uh, graphs exactly and came to very different conclusions. So these are his conclusions. Examinations of the survival curves shows that after 28 years of follow-up, social class differences in mortality among never smokers are as great or greater than those among current smokers. The important implication is that smoking abstinence or cessation has little or no long-term impact on health inequalities. So the same data, same graphs, completely different conclusions from a policy-making perspective. And I think that you can look at those graphs and reach both of those conclusions. And so that is just to highlight the way in which people bring their own kind of lens to, the, to this issue. And, and, and then that is, I feel, very much what informs their policy recommendations. The data isn't um, speaking for itself. So to go on to look a little bit at what um, has happened in relation to tobacco control, I'm going to talk a bit about Scottish um, and UK efforts. Obviously, I'm, I'm based in Scotland, so I, I sometimes end up focusing on Scottish approaches. But also, in the, um, since devolution, political devolution in um, 1998, Scotland has seen itself as a bit of a public health leader in the UK. So although the situation is actually many of the policies have, en have ended up being the same, Scotland's often the one that has taken the um, front step, has, has moved first. 
Um, and, and I'm drawing here from um, some of my own slides, but mainly from slides from Professor An Amanda Amos, who's a kind of key researcher working in this area in our university. So tobacco control um, policies during the Labour years, and, I, and I, I wanted to say a bit about the context of the Labour government that was in power from 1997 um, to, to 2010 across the UK. It, it followed a period in the UK where we'd had a, um, governments that weren't particularly interested in public health um, at all. And what, to the extent that they were interested in public health, they saw um, the government's responsibility very much as limited to public information campaigns. When Labour came in in 1997, it was a very different feel. So public health community at that time felt very positive, very optimistic. Not only were key public health issues like tobacco and health inequalities on the agenda for the first time in a very long time, so the first time in 18 years, um, it, there was also this strong commitment to evidence-based policy. So there was a lot of interaction between researchers and policymakers at that time. So and one of the first things that they did when in office was they had this smoking kills um, strategy paper, so tobacco control strategy paper. It set out a comprehensive approach to tobacco control and, and since then we've had multiple policy developments, some of which have, uh, have been supported or enhanced by um, European Union activity in this area as well. I'm not going to go through all the policies because that would be a really boring presentation. So <laughs> <laughs> I just, I've grouped some of the different things that went here. But I mean, if you think about this from a social determinants of health perspective, they were clearly thinking at lots of different levels. So thinking about what they could do to support individuals, but also what they could do to strengthen communities um, and how they could change the wider environment. So um, I think some of the key policies were... Um, Smoking cessation and NHS stop smoking services, huge amounts of money were invested in, in those. Um, there's a division within tobacco control as to whether that was a, a good use of that funding or not. Um, bans on smoking in public, place and the work, um, public places and the workplace. Um, mass media health promotion campaigns, of which there were more in England than Scotland. Tobacco tax increases, although this was one area where actually the previous government, interestingly, because they had... Um, a guy for ages who was heading up the Treasury, the, our finance office in the UK, who was also a, an official advisor to British American Tobacco. But the one policy area that he was actually quite good on was tobacco tax. So he, he, he implemented quite high tobacco tax um, rises. And, and we've had tobacco tax increases since, but not quite to the same extent. Um, bans on vending machines of tobacco products. Um, commitments to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control in Article 5.3, so a, a distancing of tobacco industry influence in policy discussions, um, bans on tobacco displays in shops, and standardised uh, um, packaging introduced most recently. So a range of different tobacco control um, policies, um, some of which, as you say, like smoking cessation is really about, and the, and the campaigns, mass media campaigns are really about encouraging people to quit, to decide to quit as individuals and supporting them. Um, but a lot of these are about changing the environment in which people are making decisions about um, purchasing tobacco products. Um, what we uh, can see happen in terms of uh, smoking rates looks very similar to the graphs that Kate had up um, um, from this area. So what we see is a reduction across all social groups, um, but what we see is that the <coughs> le least deprived are sitting at much lower levels than the most <coughs> deprived in Scotland. Um, Scotland too, so again, very similarly, we have a target for becoming uh, smoke-free, in inverted commas, so less than 5% um, by 2034, so very similar. Um, and this is a projection by Ash Scotland of, of what would need to happen in order to meet that target. And uh, <laughs> I mean, think that the general conclusion now is that while everyone in public health, I think, is excited to have the target, it's going to be very hard to meet that target. Um, and it's particularly going to be hard to bring down, obviously, the higher groups. I think there's quite a lot of... Um, if belief that this, this is going to be fine for the least deprived groups and it's the, as we get more and more deprived it's going to become harder and harder. Um, so there's been quite a lot of research funded now uh, that's look, trying to look at equity impacts of tobacco control interventions and as I say Amanda Amos is one of the people that's led on this along with my colleague Sarah Hill um, and one of the things they've done is systematic reviews of the evidence and they've done three different ones I'm, I'm just going to pull out the main messages here um, and they look, so they've looked at all types of interventions, study design and length of follow-up, and um, it, it, they've tried to go as broad as possible and to draw out what do we know about how tobacco control interventions impact on inequalities. And they, they, this is just one of the tables that they've produced, so this is looking at it um, uh, for adults, and so this shows a kind of a spread of the evidence for these different types of intervention. 
And what you can see here, I mean, the main message is that the evidence is, is pretty mixed um, and it's pretty limited for almost every type of intervention apart from tobacco tax in terms of the potential to have a positive equity impact. So I think that reinforces the sense that we're facing a very difficult prospect if we want to meet the, that 2034 target. Um, this is uh, looking at the summary, uh, so specifically pulling out um, equity impacts for individual cessation support, which as I say has been a big um, area of investment in England, and that's showing that that particular approach tends to have negative uh, equity impacts. So it tends to, w what we see with that kind of approach is that people who are better off tend to respond to this more, and so then that increases the um, inequality in smoking. So the conclusions that they've drawn, so increased tobacco control action has led to significant de declines in smoking prevalence, but no decline in inequalities in smoking. Um, we know what works to reduce smoking uptake and increase cessation, but we know much less about what works to reduce inequalities in smoking, particularly in young people. Um, and many types of tobacco control intervention that have been implemented seem to either increase or have no effect on inequalities in smoking. So, I think it is a difficult area to move forward in. Um, there is also the issue, as so I've, I've just mentioned, about intervention generated inequalities generally in public health, and basically a lot of tobacco control interventions fall into this category. So the intention is not to increase inequalities, but that is a, a, a byproduct of the fact that people who are better off uh, are more able to respond. There's also a bit of a, so although tobacco taxes looks like a promising area from a smoking inequalities perspective, there's a lack of research on what the overall equity impacts of increasing taxes is. And so some countries have really gone down this route of thinking, well, you know, it works at population level and it works in equity terms, so we're going to just really hike up tobacco taxes. So Australia is committed to raising tobacco taxes to over $40 by the year 2020. So, so the cost of tax will be over 40 Australian dollars. Um, that's a huge amount. When you're talking about that kind of level of taxation, obviously there are substantial impacts on family income. And we know that tobacco is an addictive product and is harder to give up if you're living in difficult circumstances. So we would expect that that kind of policy intervention would have impact on people's ability to pay for housing, heating, um, food and so on. So, and that, this is an area of research which just hasn't really been looked at. Um, and, the, and there is also one thing I wanted to say a little bit more about. Hilary Graham's done some great work on this. In tobacco control, there has been in the UK a bit of a sense that denormalisation of smoking um, and tobacco is a really positive thing that helps bring rates down. But that obviously also has um, implications in relation to stigma and how people feel about themselves if they are a smoker. Um, and so Hilary Graham gave a talk about that recently. She's written a really good paper on this. Um, and, and she was highlighting the way in which smoking as an act now in the UK tends to be an, seen as an indicator of being lower, lower social class. So, that she, so she's pulled out a few kind of very popular TV programs, this one's called Little, Little Britain, and this is how the BBC website describes the kind of main character, Vicky Pollard, so who's offensive in all kinds of ways. <laughs> Vicky Pollard is your common or garden teenager delinquent, the sort you can see hanging around any number of off-licenses, so that's alcohol shops in Britain, trying to persuade people to go inside and buy them ten fags and a bottle of white lightning, so cheap cider. Whether nicking stuff from the supermarket or swapping her baby for a Westlife CD, Vicky reacts to any accusation with indignant outrage while filling you in on this thing what you know nothing about. So you can see the depiction there. And, I, and, I, and you know, it's true it comes across through many kind of um, media outlets. This is another example, another comedy show called Shameless. And again, you can see the main character here being strongly associated with tobacco smoking. And it's just an area in which I think um, tobacco control researchers are only just starting to uh, think through what the implications of that are. So I'm going to move on now to talk about UK efforts to reduce health inequalities. And um, I think the UK is a, a really interesting uh, country to look at, no, not just because I'm from there and it's what I've studied, but it's the, <laughs> it's the country that's kind of taken the most comprehensive and long-term approach to tackling health inequalities so far. So this is um, a little graph that um, Mack and Mack and Backer put together, um, which were, they, they were reviewing uh, countries across Europe that, and their approaches to health inequalities, um, and they kind of reviewed each country's approach. But it's just showing that the UK was kind of has always been ahead of the pack here. So from 1980, when we had the um, 
The Black Report was published, which had been commissioned by the Labour government in 1977, published in 1980. Um, the, the government completely tried to shut down that report, and it was basically ignored by the government for the next 18 years, but it did trigger a lot of research in this area. And then we have a lot of policy activity from 1995 onwards. So the basic timeline of what happened in the UK. So I think the th the, there was some thinking that when we established the National Health Service in 1948 that that would deal with health inequalities. Like once healthcare was free at the point of delivery, um, we shouldn't have health inequalities anymore. So it's some surprise um, when in the 1950s, 60s and 70s it emerged that health inequalities se had seemed to have persisted despite that. So then we have this government commissioned review, um, but it's published under a government that's uh, really not in favour of it. And then finally we get Labour elected in 1997 on this um, kind of commitment to what matters and what works and they immediately com commission a follow-up to the Black Report that was known as the Atchison Review. They stay in, off in power in, in the UK level for 13 years. They do a lot of activity but by the end of that time, um, in 2010, the National Audit Office, which is the office that looks at how different parts of the government have spent their money and uh, whether they've achieved value for money, reveals that health inequalities have not reduced. I mean, I mean people, people already knew this. And the government also uh, commissioned a, a third review of health inequalities evidence, the Marmot Review. Um, so there's a lot of reviewing of the evidence going on. Um, and then La Labour were defeated at, at the UK level and, and the emphasis on health inequalities at the UK level has become much less clear since then. So this is just a kind of example of, of the sort of headline that we get every year. So you can get this kind of headline from any year that you look, that the health inequality gap is still growing, um, and you can get it for any different country in the UK. Um, and this was a little BBC News piece that was on um, that National Audit Office report, which was, so that you can see the headline is, the health gap drive is wasted money. So uh, there is a real pressure here on the health inequalities community. I think there's a real uh, danger that this uh, issue of tackling health inequalities no longer seems politically attractive to anyone, um, given what, what has happened. So um, it's important that we try to learn the lessons that we can. So what explains this lack of success? Um, there are a range of different views. So some people would say that the evidence didn't give policymakers enough sense of what to do and what would be effective. Um, some people would say that, that the policies, so this is kind of the opposite argument, the policies that were developed didn't reflect the available evidence and that the evidence was sufficient. Um, and that would have been, you know, for various reasons, lack of political will, an important one was a perceived lack of public mandate, which I'm going to come on to in, in a bit later, or the sense that health interests were out lobbied um, by other often economic interests. Um, and then the third thing, which I think there's more agreement on, is that there are a range of other policies which weren't in the health sector which is, have exacerbated health inequalities. This is a, a little chart of the policy activity from England um, that went on around health inequalities in this period. So you can see that they're not lacking in kind of making announcements about what they're going to do on health inequalities. I think some of the interesting uh, developments to highlight here is that not all of these came from the Department of Health. So the, the Tackling Health Inequalities 2002 Cross-Cutting Review was from the Treasury, and then later on we had um, policies that were more from kind of local government departments. So there was some effort to make this not just health department policies. Um, some of the kind of interventions that they uh, implemented, I mean, there were, there were so many, um, so, and there were so many different things going on, and I think that makes it in many ways hard to learn lessons. They did things at a range of different levels, um, if, if we think about the social determinants of health rainbow model. So they did lots of different exercises on trying to get people to change their behaviours. So there was tobacco control thing, there, there was targeting of smoking cessation services to poorer areas, there was a national diet ad, um, action plan. Um, there were also a range of different things that had different labels over the years that basically involved um, giving poorer communities a pot of money and then saying you as a community should work together to think about how to spend that money. And so there are, there are a real positive of that. It was a real effort to work with communities collaboratively. Um, so healthy living centres were one example of that. Health action zones were another. The kind of downside is that that makes that very hard to evaluate as an intervention. You can't really evaluate health li healthy living centres when they, they are completely different things in completely different areas. Um, they also uh, expected health services to play a strong role in tackling health inequalities. They did things like they uh, tried to increase access time so that people could access the NHS 24 hours a day. Um, they also uh, reduced waiting times, but they also did things like try to get the NHS to um, push exercise on prescription and things like this. So there were a lot of different things going on at those levels. 
In this kind of yellow level of changing living and working conditions, again, there was a lot of activity going on. Um, I won't go through, through it all. Importantly, there was a national minimum wage was introduced. There were some improvements in, in the equalities of, uh, associated with benefits and tax credits. There was a lot on tobacco control that we've already talked about. And then there were a range of these, issue, uh, these initiatives that were, as I say, pots of giving pots of money to local areas and letting them decide. So healthy living zones and health action zones. Yeah. Yes, I can. I will slow down. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so um, but what's interesting, I think, is when you move to this outer layer of this rainbow model, so that's the kind of socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental conditions, there are far fewer activities that we can identify. A lot of health inequalities researchers would say that's one of the fundamental areas where you need to have more activity. So um, they did try and uh, have tried to push this idea of using health impact assessments. So it's so basically a tool that you would give to policymakers in different departments and try to get them to think about the health impacts of their decisions. Um, there's been some efforts to make the tax system slightly more progressive, very minimal, um, and some efforts to improve equality of uh, opportunity. So there were some efforts around education and employment in particular. However, there were also a range of policies introduced that were not intended to reduce health inequalities, but that we might expect would actually have increased health inequalities. So there were a number of things that were um, done, um, like relaxing gambling laws, um, extending licensing hours so it became much easier to get alcohol, for example, um, increasing tuition fees, so making it harder for people to get higher education. There are a range of different policies that if you thought about it from a health inequalities perspective, you would immediately think this is probably not going to have a good a positive equity impact. And there was also um, a general, I think, lack of interest actually in inequality amongst some key members of the Labour movement. So this is uh, Peter Mandelson, um, a famous figure in New Labour in England, saying we are intensely relaxed about people getting filthy rich as long as they pay their taxes. So actually, while some people in the Labour Party were interested in inequalities, some were only really interested in poverty and didn't see any connection between what was going on in the upper echelons of society um, and society overall. Um, there was also this shift that you can see very clearly in the policy documents over time. So from the early documents of Labour, even before they got elected in 1997, and then the later statements. And this shift is very much from the upstream to the downstream. So from the outer layers of the rainbow model to the individual level. So the first green paper on public health that Labour government published um, says, says very clearly Tackling inequalities generally is the best means of tackling health inequalities in particular. When we get to Tony Blair's um, Our Nation's Future lecture, which was his kind of um, departing tour when he was still Prime Minister, he decided to go around the country and do a series of last speeches. So in 2006, he said, our public health problems are not, strictly speaking, public health questions at all. They are questions of individual lifestyle, obesity, smoking, alcohol abuse, diabetes, sexually transmitted disease. So a completely um, different perspective there. And I think one of the things, one of the ways in which we can understand that is the way in which health inequalities were conceptualized um, was not this social gradient of health cutting across all um, different groups in society that Michael Marmot and others have really pushed. So that, that is referred to a lot in the research and, and it's referred to as a term in the policy documents, but when you actually look at how they conceptualise health inequalities, they conceptualise health inequalities as being about health gaps between different groups, different income groups or diff people in different places. Um, and then they conceptualise those health gaps as being the result of health disadvantage, so basically of poor, he poor people behaving badly, if you want to put it crudely. Um, so then that very logically translates into efforts to improve the health behaviours of those people living in poor areas rather than to think about population-wide um, kind of approaches. Um, and if we think just in a little bit more detail about the arguments about the role that research evidence played in this, um, I mean, I think in some ways there are a, a lack of evidence-based policies, and there are two different reasons for that. So I think there was a lack of evidence on specifically what would work, but I think if you're the first country that's taking action in this area, um, you can't expect there to be a strong evidence base around what will work, and you kind of have to be willing to um, lead the way and, and work with researchers to evaluate that. Um, I think some people say, uh, I think this is fair enough in some ways, that some of the policies might have been effective if they'd been implemented at a sort of higher dose. So if they'd hit more people or, or worked that had higher resources. 
Some people say we just haven't had enough time, you know, with a whole life course perspective, maybe in a few years' time, actually we'll see, um, and, and there is starting to emerge some evidence that some of the policies that focus more on young people are having an impact now, several years later. Um, but this idea that the, there's a lack of evidence, I think, continues to hold th this whole area back. And I think it's very interesting when comparing it to tobacco control, because I think countries that have led the way on tobacco control have not been afraid to go a bit ahead of the evidence, um, sort of based on what theoretically looks plausible. They, governments have been willing to implement those things, like um, plain packaging, for example. Mm. So I'm just going to compare briefly what happened with the kind of evidence that health inequalities researchers themselves were promoting. How am I doing for time? Um, so this is the sum up of the Marmot Review recommendations, so another government, the third government commissioned review. Um, so they, they argue reducing health inequalities will require action on six policy objectives. Um, and they list them there. I won't read them all. But they're things like give every child the best start in life, Enable all children, young people and adults to maximise their capability and have control over their lives. Create fair employment and good work for all. So they're like, they're nice goals. Who would disagree with those things? But they're just, they're not very specific policy actions. And I, and I think that is one of the areas where health inequalities research could really learn from tobacco control. Um, so I have wanted to push researchers um, to get a bit more specific about what they actually think policies, what policies they actually think should be implemented to tackle health inequalities. So I did a survey, an online survey of health inequalities researchers um, of this. And there were two stages to it. And I basically tried to collate in the first stage all of the recommendations that I could find in the literature around policy recommendations for reducing health inequalities. And then I asked people to answer a series of questions on them. Um, the, there's some interesting, uh, this is not really part of this presentation, but there's some interesting findings in that uh, researchers give very different answers if they're asked, asked to answer what do you think based on the strength of the evidence versus what do you think based on your own expertise. Based on their own expertise, they go much more upstream. Based on the strength of the evidence, they go downstream which says, I think, something about the available evidence. But these were the top um, five proposals. If you, if you looked at all, across all the different answers, these were the top five um, from both stages. So review and implement more progressive systems of taxation, develop and implement a minimum income for healthy living, increase the proportion of overall government expenditure allocated to early years, increase social protection for those on the lowest income, support an enhanced home building um, program and invest in decent social housing. So none of these are traditional health policies. They're all moving us very much upstream. Um, but one of the reasons that uh, health inequalities researchers and the policy makers that I've interviewed, and I've interviewed a lot of them over the years through various different projects, um, so I've, I've got about 150 interviews from across this period. Um, so one of the things that they often said was, well, even if we really believe the evidence, the public just don't support these kinds of policies, so we can't implement these policies. Um, or sometimes, I, I'm sold, I believe you, um, I believe what the evidence is saying, but um, the public just won't support this. But there was very little sense of um, how they were assessing what the public would and would not support. Um, so that's just really making this point. So the, the public were kind of implica implicated as uh, political actors who were resistant to the kinds of policy proposals emerging from the health inequalities evidence. Um, but it was like um, Walker and colleagues have said, the public seemed to exist as imaginaries, given agency and invoked for strategic purposes by actors, rather than this being based in a review of evidence or a conversation with the public. So I then, more recently, have wanted to ask, well, what do the public actually think about health inequalities and potential policy responses in the UK? And there's various different ways in which you could answer that question. So the first thing I did was to review the existing qualitative literature. So existing studies where researchers have asked people, particularly on the whole, people who are experiencing uh, deprivation and poverty, what they think about this relationship. There's, only, there's limited evidence, so we only came across 17 uh, studies. Um, and there's methodological variation within this. But all of the in-depth qualitative studies find public explanations of the link between socioeconomic deprivation and poor health support researchers' concerns with the social determinants of health. I mean, that's not really a surprise. These people are experiencing uh, that and living through that and, and can see those connections. 
this is a, a very bad diagram, so apologies, it was more for myself, but I think it is useful. In um, What I tried to do was with each article, with each study, I tried to map out the connections that people themselves were making between their environment and their poor health. And then this one is where I've tried to put all of those diagrams together. But I think it is helpful in highlighting that the people have a very complex understanding of all of the different factors that are impacting on their health. Other things that emerged from that review were really the importance of employment. Um, so large-scale industrial closures, which I know you've experienced in Canada as well. Um, we've had a series of very big ones from the 1980s. Um, people gave very strong um, emotive accounts of the impact on health. So this is someone from the Welsh Valleys, a, a mining industrial area. So the first link to go was the mines. But that was OK. After a while, it was devastating for the miners. But that was okay, really, because some of them could get work here, in the steelworks. Some people moved away, but a lot of them came back as well. A lot of the miners came back, and the second chain, the second link in the chain was British Steel. When it was announced, it was closing, and to me, that was the death knell in the town. Everybody stood still, oh my God. And it was like, if that chain was broken and it was flung away, everybody there just didn't know what to do, none of us really. So you can see the kind of um, real sense in which that changed, not just individuals, but whole communities. And then the more recent accounts of um, employment in the UK, particularly amongst long, young people, was very much a no-pay, low-pay cycle. So this was not people who were never experiencing employment and just sitting on benefits, but they were constantly moving out of insecure employment and on, on back onto benefits and then back into insecure employment, um, creating very difficult um, health context and um, very difficult context into which, which to make healthy decisions. Um, when it comes to unhealthy commodities, so smoking is obviously one of those, but also drugs, alcohol and um, unhealthy food, what really interested me was the consistency with which these were described across the different studies. So this table is just kind of summarising that, but they were consistently described as things that could uh, distract you um, and uh, kind of help take you away from your difficult circumstances. So uh, this is just so, so this is um, a piece by Hilary Graham about smoking. So for many of the mothers who were caring on a full-time basis for children, smoking a cigarette emerged as their only luxury and their only leisure activity. Um, and then for unhealthy diets, I really like this quote. So people are always going to buy cakes. It's just the pills of life. They eat cakes and biscuits and sweets on and so on that taste nice and they make you think of different things. Um, there's a bit of a paradox here because people really understand, people experiencing it really understand the connections between these wider determinants and, and um, poor health, but when you ask them to talk about health inequalities specifically, they're reluctant to talk about it, reluctant to acknowledge those health inequalities. And I think if you look at why that is, a sense of that it is to do with the stigma and shame, not only of being um, poor, but also of poor health. And people are resistant to anything that categorizes them as being more likely to experience those things. And that means I think it's very difficult to have public conversations about health inequalities. So there's been a lot of efforts in the UK to get discussions about health inequalities out there into the media and a sense that the public just don't get this and if they only got it then we'd be able to implement these evidence-informed policies. This is a quote that I think made me in particular stop and question that. So it's, a, it's in Scots, and I don't have a Scots accent, so I shall read it in, in English, apologies. So nearly every day I'm picking this paper up, the newspaper. I'm reading about life expectancy with me and compared maybe with staying down in London. They're absolutely kicking you every way they can. And if you're in a poor area, you'll always be in a poor area. Nobody's going to try and help you out. But if you're in an affluent area, to hell with the rest. So a sense that just the process of reading about health inequalities in the newspaper itself could be, um, make you feel quite disempowered and stigmatised. I, so I also asked this question during a national survey. I think this is the least interesting way of asking people, so I'm not going to say lots about it. But what it did say was that most people actually support the research-informed policies that researchers, um, that, so all of them actually, so most people supported all of the research-informed policies, including the more economic ones like increase the minimum wage and introduce higher taxes for richer people. Um, we then did these things called citizens' juries, which is a more deliberative approach, where we, we were getting around 20 people in three different cities who were um, broadly representative of different groups together to, for two days to debate research evidence and potential policy responses on health inequalities. And for me, this is a, a better way of asking this question. Um, and so they got to hear lots of different evidence, including from tobacco control advocates about the need to, to bring, so they got these two different perspectives I talked about at the beginning, and also from people with a more social determinants of health perspective. 
What we see is that there is a bit of a change at the beginning of the intervention and at the end. Um, so people move away from thinking that the NHS is the answer to health inequalities and start to spread out across a wider range of more upstream policies, particularly economic policies. Um, and, and that shift was unexpected based on the discussions on the first day when people seemed really resistant to the idea that it was anything but individual behaviours and in the NHS. Um, so we got them to do lots of different things, but the top results from their collective um, voting exercise, which I found particularly interesting, um, I won't go through these in detail, but the key thing is, again, much like researchers, with a, with a little bit of exception of spending more money on the NHS in Manchester and Liverpool, they generally move towards economic redistributive kind of policies as being their preferred approach to tackling health inequalities. Um, I think I'm going to skip these slides. I just wanted to briefly mention some new policy developments in Scotland, which I think are a bit more exciting from a health and qualities perspective. Um, so uh, there are moves, I think, to go, go upstream in Scotland as compared to England. So one thing, one council in Scotland is now thinking about rolling out free school meals, um, not just at school times, but for all children every day of the week, 365 days a year, to ensure that all children in Scotland um, are able to get a healthy diet. There's been experiments with the trial of a universal basic income. I'm sure you've probably heard about that idea. Um, there's been a baby box scheme, so that every baby born in Scotland now gets a box and that can act as a, a cop that's full of different baby stuff. Um, there's been a, a very successful experiment uh, to pay women from poorer communities to quit smoking. Now, the results of that are very positive from a health equity perspective, but as you might imagine, some of the media coverage, less positive. <laughs> so, the Scotland, so the government's a bit nervous there. Um, and there have been lots of more, these more deliberative approaches, like the citizens' juries that I described, especially around budgeting. So bringing people, members of the community, and researchers and policymakers together to talk about how they're going to spend um, public, public money. So just to end, I want to talk about how we might bring tobacco control and health inequalities agendas together. So one, I think, is to understand that smoking is a cause of poverty, but also um, poverty is influencing smoking rates. Um, and I think there are some positive moves in Scotland with Ash Scotland, our main tobacco control advocacy group, and Poverty Alliance coming together. One of the ways in which they've done that is Ash Scotland is now officially supporting the Stick Your Labels campaign, which is designed by Poverty Alliance to get over the stigma of poverty. Um, there is interest in this kind of health and all policies approach uh, across Europe, but Scotland's more interested than England. Um, there are, I think, real efforts, recognition now in health inequalities, that you don't change policy just by getting better evidence, that you have to move into thinking about understanding the politics of policy making. And that is one area where, as I say, I think um, tobacco control has, has been better. Um, so you've got people like Joachim Mackenbach calling for more advocacy around health inequalities. Um, there's a recognition about this lack of advocacy in health inequalities, and this is a, a, a lot of people, my interviews reflecting on that, and they often compared it to tobacco control. So tobacco control is seen by a lot of health inequalities researchers as, as a place that got advocacy right and that we can um, learn from. Um, so that, that's a kind of recognition of that comparison there. Uh, in my book, I, I compare this to really um, in some detail, and what you can see here is that all of the features of public health advocacy that Simon Chapman talks about very strongly evident in tobacco control in the UK are much less so in health inequalities. Um, where we do have advocacy in health inequalities, it tends to focus on just trying to get the public to understand that there is a health gap. So this is a football health league table that Claire Bamber put together. It was really clever in that it got into the Daily Mail, a very right-wing tabloid. Um, so it got health inequalities into that venue. But effectively, what it, all it's doing is really saying there are these health gaps. It's not really uh, a conversation about how to tackle health inequalities yet. So my preliminary conclusions, we need to move beyond these public health silos and start thinking a lot about how to bring health inequalities and tackling tobacco control together so that they're seen more as part of the same agenda. And a particular, in particular, I'm keen, although I know it's very difficult, for people in tobacco control to understand the way in which social determinants of health influence tobacco um, decisions and patterns. I also think we need to move beyond this idea of evidence-based policy, and I don't know how big an issue it is here, but in the UK I feel it's really held public health back, because in many ways it's quite a conservative idea. It sort of says we don't need to take policy action until we've got really strong evidence, but you're not going to get that really strong evidence of upstream policies <laughs> unless you're willing to move first. I think we need to think really carefully about what the democratically legitimate role of evidence is in public health policy. So, so far, despite the word public being in public health, I think we've been very bad in the UK at engaging members of the public, um, at talking to them, but particularly at listening to people.
Um, and, and so then we have all these myths about what the public actually think and support and, and don't support. Um, and as part of this, uh, one of the things that we did in the citizens' juries and that people do in participatory budgeting is to be very explicit about what the potential trade-offs are between different policy areas. So if you spend money on this, then you can't spend money on this. If you're going to, you, you know, one trade-off might be you're going to bring down tobacco levels overall, but you're going to allow inequalities in smoking to increase. But to just get more explicit about those trade-offs. And then um, focusing on public support for research-informed uh, policies, I think, starts to challenge research and policy perceptions that there is a lack of public mandate and that that is the block, the stumbling block. Okay, thanks. Okay. Sorry, I went over time. Thank you very much.